Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Ream Library. My name is Tom Landy. I direct the Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture here at the college. The center is celebrating its 10th anniversary this year. It supports the mission of the college with programming that opens dialogue on issues of meaning, morality, and mutual obligation. One of the themes we're exploring this year is the global migration of people, ideas, and species, and the ethical implications, the issues that arise from such mobility. Next semester is part of the series, among other talks, will host speakers such as Eliza Griswold, author of The Tenth Parallel, Dispatches in the Fault Line Between Christianity and Islam. I invite you to visit our website at holycross.edu slash crec for a calendar of events, and you can find uh, past lectures online, audios, and uh, now uh, videos of those we started this year. Tonight, we're really pleased to welcome uh, Ben Skinner to talk about modern-day slavery across international borders. Ben is an investigative journalist and the author of A Crime So Monstrous, Face-to-Face -face with Modern-Day Slavery. While researching the book, he tracked down dozens of slaves, former slaves, and slave dealers, and he became the first person to observe negotiations for the sale of human beings on four continents. The book won the 2009 Dayton Literary Peace Prize for nonfiction, and one of the chapters was adapted into an Emmy Award-winning episode of ABC's Nightline called How to Buy a Child in 10 Hours. Copies of that book were available for sale just outside Ream Library, and 25% uh, of those royalties go to free the slaves, a group dedicated to ending slavery worldwide. Ben is a senior fellow at the Schuster Institute for Investigative Journalism at Brandeis University in Waltham. He's written for Time, Newsweek International, the Los Angeles Times, the Miami Herald, Foreign Affairs, and Foreign Policy, among others. He serves on the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on Illicit Trade. Please join me in welcoming Ben Skinner. Thanks very much, Tom. And thank you all so much for coming. Um, I want to start out by framing uh, the issue uh, in, in very specific and concrete terms so that we all understand what it is that I'm talking about when I'm talking about slavery. Um, and then uh, as we get into it, in keeping with the theme of the series, um, I will talk uh, a bit more about the, um, uh, uh, the effect of, of globalization, the effect of forest borders, uh, and uh, particularly uh, a topic that's very close to my heart right now and that I'm delving into very heavily, which is the effect of uh, attenuated supply chains and the products that we buy, that we buy on, on, um, uh, on the issue of modern day slavery. Um, first of all, thank you very much again, Tom. Thank you all for coming. Um, and I, I particularly want to thank the, the students that were part of the, uh, the series committee that I just had dinner with. Very impressive, and, and uh, folks that, uh, any of you who are interested in what I'm talking about should, should seek them out, uh, because there are people that are doing work on modern day slavery here on campus. Um, and uh, it's a topic, fundamentally, that is uh, of our generation, and which our generation needs to, uh, needs to own if we are to, uh, to end it uh, in our lifetimes, which I think is possible. Um, uh, as I said, to start out with, I, I want to be clear, uh, crystal clear on what it is that I'm talking about when I say slavery. Uh, I was in China a week and a half ago at a meeting of the uh, World Economic Forum, and the, the majority of folks at the World Economic Forum, the constituents, are uh, folks in, in the private sector. And uh, in particular, the groups that I was in, I was having a lot of conversations with, with hedge funders and with, uh, with investment managers, uh, institutional investors. And uh, I brought it up what I did. Um, and uh, I actually, you, know, you get into all these little conversations in these, in these uh, conferences. And particularly for these international conferences, in, in many cases, you just, you just kind of want to get back to your hotel the first day and, and uh, get to bed early and deal with the jet lag. Um, and uh, so I was trying to end a conversation early, and this is a technique that I've, I've tried to use before. Um, and uh, somebody came up and said, uh, uh, you know, uh, good to meet you, what do you do? Um, and I said, well, I'm a, I'm a specialist. 
in uh, mass atrocities, in modern day slavery, and in child rape. And that usually ends the conversation. <laughs> and then I can slip away and go back to my hotel room. Um, in this case, he said, well, you know, I'm, I'm, in, uh, I'm in finance. You want to talk about modern day slavery, you should see the hours that I've had to work over the last 10 years. Um, and, uh, and I said, well, you know, what I'm talking about is a little different. The people that I study, uh, in the eyes of their employers, are actually disposable. Uh, and he said, you know, have you, uh, have you talked to, to any uh, entry level uh, folks at, at any big banks? Um, and, I, and I realized it was going to be a longer conversation and, and it actually uh, wound up being a four day conversation and at the end of it um, he came up with some very uh, interesting ideas for aggressive activist shareholding. Um, am I still on back there? Okay. Um, and. Uh, and um, fundamentally, I, I, I think, I hope, I made a, I made a convert, and I hope uh, today I can make a, a few more. And it, and it starts fundamentally with understanding what slavery is, because just as that banker uh, alluded to, the, the definition in today's world has become devalued. It's become uh, a metaphor for undue hardship. If you look up in, in Merriam-Webster dictionary, the first definition of slavery today is drudgery or toil. Uh, the the uh, uh, footballer um, Cristiano Ronaldo, uh, when he was playing for Manchester United, he was at the time the highest paid soccer player in the world, and he said that he was held as a modern day slave because Manchester United wouldn't let him out of the contract to go and play for Real Madrid. Mind you, he was making $24,000 per week to play soccer, and he called himself a modern-day slave. Clearly, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about are those who are forced to work, held through fraud, under threat of violence, for no pay beyond subsistence. And by that mere definition, there are more slaves in the world today than at any point in human history. So I started out with that as a premise. Uh, I started out with, with, the, with the mere definition, which is handed to me from a scholar named Kevin Bales, who wrote a book, um, which you should all go out and read after you read mine, um, called Disposable People, published in 1999. Uh, and his definition, again, forced to work, held through fraud, under threat of violence for no pay beyond subsistence. He derived that from the 1930 International Labor Office definition of forced labor. Uh, and by his definition, he estimated there are 27 million slaves in the world today. And so I started out with that as a, as a, as a supposition, as a premise. And I realized early on that I, working alone as a 20-something researcher, and I was all of 24 years old when I started work on this, uh, could not go out and count every slave. But what I could do was try to uh, figure out where they are on a map, A, and then B, try to tell a few representative stories and allow slaves to speak through me. So start with that first challenge. Where, where are they on a map? Um, if the theme is, is uh, of the series is uh, 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 issues across borders, we have to first acknowledge that uh, very much, uh, perhaps counterintuitive or, or against what you may have heard about human trafficking in the past, the majority of slaves in the world today never actually cross a border. They're, they're held typically in what the United Nations in its deathless prose uh, uh, refers to as collateralized, generational, hereditary uh, debt bondage. Uh, the, the UN is, is uh, and UN officials are, are very gifted sometimes uh, at sanitizing crimes against humanity with language, so uh, genocide becomes ethnic cleansing, the slave trade becomes human trafficking, and, and the, the crime committed against individuals who, who 
uh, took no debt themselves in many cases, but the, 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 the slavery that is imposed on them becomes this collateralized debt bondage. To put that in more real and more stark terms, uh, I spent time in a, uh, in a quarry in northern India, and, and this was part of a much, much larger investigation, but I settled on, on one quarry because uh, the, the slavery in this one quarry was particularly dark. A, an individual that I uh, focused in on, who I call Ganu, and I still call him Ganu because as far as I know today, he is still in bondage and therefore he is still very much, his life is still very much in jeopardy, and he asked me to change his name. Uh, this, this fellow had been born a slave. Uh, he was a third generation slave. His grandfather had taken a debt uh, of the equivalent of 62 cents in rupees. And three generations and three slave masters later, he and his entire family were forced to work in a quarry. And essentially what they were forced to do under, under threat of violence and suffering real violence on a regular basis, they were, they were forced to uh, blast rocks out of the earth and it was the children in the families uh, in this village that would go in and plant blasting explosives. And once those rocks were blasted up out of the earth, the, the entire family would descend on these rocks with pikes and mortars. Uh, they would work from before uh, sunrise till after sunset every day. They would go back to huts without any electricity. And once the, once the, uh, once the rocks were broken down into, into finer grade rocks, they would load those onto trucks and those, those rocks would be the, the subgrade for India's many infrastructure projects. And then beyond that, they would pulverize those rocks down into sand, into silica sand, which is an element in the manufacture of glass. And in the modern world, there is only one way that you can turn a profit off of handmade sand, and that's through slavery. And the individual that forced this man's family to work and his two brothers, who were contractors in neighboring quarries that forced entire villages to work, three entire villages, um, they exerted their labor out of their human jackhammers through sheer unmitigated violence, unmitigated by the, the laws of India, the national laws of India, which, were, which are robust and based on a, uh, a strong constitution but not enforced at the local level. I went, into a, uh, I went into a local constabulary and talked to police about the particular individual that ran this quarry. And they brought out one of these old ledgers that you know, was sort of one of these uh, British colonial Raj era ledgers. And, and they went through the, the number of uh, crimes that this man had been indicted for. And among them, over the last 12 years, were five murders. And these were murders of high caste Indians that had actually been reported to the police. According to the slaves that I interviewed when I went in at night into the, into the Joparis, into the huts in the, in the village, he had killed over a dozen of their <coughs> fellow workers. And yet those murders had never been reported to the police. So at one point, I uh, in, in the conversations, I, I went to him and I said, um, why don't you run away? Why don't you leave? I can get in here at night. You can, you can get out. And I had been, I'd been reading the, uh, the writings and the speeches of Mahatma Gandhi as I was traveling around India on a train. And uh, the Mahatma had a very... Um, had a very uh, moving statement about slavery. He said, when a slave decides not to be a slave, the bond is snapped and the, and the fetters fall. Slavery and freedom are mental constructs. To, to Gandhi, that's all it was. It was a question of, of deciding not to be a slave. And when I asked Ganu that question, why don't you leave, why don't you run, 
his first response to me was, where would I go and how would I eat? For, for Ganu and for millions of slaves in the world today, the, the idea of being a slave is not just a mental construct. It's not just as Gandhi put it. For Ganu, slavery was his world. And Ramesh, his master, was God in that world. He was, the, he was the taker of life, but he was also the giver of sustenance. And the, the concept of leaving first was impossible to conceive of because of the violence that, that Ganu would be visited on, uh, Ganu knew would be visited on him and his family and had been visited on him and his family. But beyond that, he couldn't conceive of living on his own. And so when we think of ways to eradicate slavery once and for all, and again, I think that's something that we can, we can do in a generation, we have to fundamentally think about the next step after liberation. We, we botched our emancipation in this country. We, we fought a civil war and, and my great-great-great-grandfather uh, fought on the, uh, thankfully on the, on the right side of things. Um, and that's a very proud history. But we dumped over three million new Americans on an economy with no skills training with no access to uh, property rights and with scant defense of their civil rights. And 100 and 170 years later, we are, or nearly 150 years after the Emancip Emancipation Proclamation, actually, next year being the sesquicentennial, we are still paying the price for that botched emancipation. So stepping back and getting back to that map of, of the globe and, and looking at where our slaves exist. The vast majority are held in, in, in generational debt bondage. They're held in South Asia. But across international borders, according to the International Organization for Migration, according to the UN, uh, according to the US State Department, on an annual basis, between 600 and 800,000 are trafficked into some form of slavery. Trafficked, which, as I mentioned, to me is a euphemism. It's the recruitment, it's the transport, it's the harboring of people for the purposes of, of forcing some service out of them, whether that service be forced prostitution, whether that service be uh, forced labor in a, in a brick kiln or, a, uh, or an agricultural setting, or whether that, that uh, service be, as in the case of one young uh, woman who, was, uh, who I interviewed for my book as a domestic slave, in a, in a house, in a $340,000 house in uh, suburban Miami in Pembroke Pines. Um, as I mentioned, in this country, it exists as well. And according to the Department of Justice, there are between 14 and 17,000 that are trafficked into slavery each and every year, right here in the United States and right here in Massachusetts. According to those estimates, uh, if I'm talking now for an hour before we begin the Q&A, uh, on average in that hour, two more people will become slaves in the United States. So the, the statistics are, are overwhelming. Um, and a, a big caveat about the statistics, and this is where I hope Many of you who are interested in going into academia or interested in doing research on this will, will help by doing more research. Uh, the individuals that I'm talking about don't raise their hands. They don't uh, wait in line for their census to be taken. And that last category in particular, those, those slaves that are trafficked into the United States, one thing that's often lost in debates over immigration uh, is the ethical implications of what restrictive immigration policies do to people who may have wanted to come to this country in the first place, but are trapped in a situation that they can't leave. <coughs> and this is, for me, a, a vital piece of the discussion that I don't hear enough conversation about. Traffickers in this country will often, and I've heard this time and time again from survivors that I've spoken to, and from advocates who work on their behalf, 
traffickers will play on slaves' fear of authority. Slaves are told, if you self-identify, you will be deported. And when you get back to Guatemala, when you get back to Nicaragua, when, when you get back to Laos, when you get back to Cambodia, we will take our due. And if we can't find you, we'll take our due from your families. And so as we think about solutions to this, we have to think again, fundamentally, about the best interest of those who are the victims of, of what, to my eye, is the most prevalent and yet the most underreported crime against humanity in the world today. Um, and on that note, what I set out to do with this book, fundamentally, um, as I say, was to get beyond those statistics. You have to, anytime you're going to quote Joseph Stalin, you have to kind of qualify a little bit. Um, uh, sometimes it's the worst people that have the best quotes. Um, Stalin was supposed to have said, the, the death of a, of a million men is a statistic. Uh, the death of one man is a tragedy. And so what I set out to do with the, uh, with the book and with my subsequent writings for Time Magazine and with the investigative project that I'm uh, beginning in, uh, in 2012 was to put a human face on the statistics. Um, and to allow slaves and survivors to tell their stories through me, and to go a step further and actually to try and find traffickers, try and find those who profit from the sale of human beings. And what I found, terrifyingly, was that this is not a crime that is far from where we are. Uh, and since the book came out, and as I was working as a as a fellow at the, the Kennedy School up at Harvard, and local police and ex-police would come in and tell me their stories, I began to realize that I didn't have to go as far as I did uh, in the opening chapter of the book. But in the opening chapter of the book, I wanted to prove a point. Uh, and so Tom mentioned the, the chapter that was adapted by, uh, by Nightline. Uh, and. Um, won an Emmy, which I found out about six months after they won the Emmy, but that's neither here nor there. Um, let's say, for our purposes, that we're in the center of the moral universe. And we, we all agree uh, with the, the general uh, state of, of uh, civilization. We, 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 we ag agree that we have moved in the right direction with uh, over a dozen universal conventions banning slavery and the slave trade, over 300 treaties banning slavery and the slave trade, the 13th Amendment, the Emancipation Proclamation. Let's say that we're in the center of the moral universe. From where we are, we are some seven hours from being able to negotiate in broad daylight the sale of a healthy boy or a healthy girl. And I was able to do this uh, in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, uh, which, is about a, uh, which is about five hours from where I was living in Brooklyn at the time, uh, I was able to pull up on a street uh, about an hour from Toussaint Louverture uh, Airport. In 2005, a uh, little bit of context, this was, this was after the, the coup during an interim government, but this was a, a, a very orderly street. This was a a, uh, a part of Port-au-Prince that hadn't been uh, hugely affected by the, um, by the upheaval, by the violence. And in front of a barber shop, there were four men standing. And I pulled up in a car, rolled down a window, one of the men came over and said, do you want to get a person? And the, the person that was offered to me was a 12-year-old girl, and the explicit use of this person would be for domestic work, unpaid domestic work. This child was to cook, this child was to clean, this child was to carry water. In other words, her responsibilities would have been, for the most part, what the responsibilities of the 175,000 to 300,000, that's the UNICEF estimate, uh, child domestic slaves in Haiti 
what they are expected to do, again, for no pay. Uh, they, this is, in, in theory, the way this system works is, is it's an exchange between poor rural parents who, who can't afford to send their children to school um, and more well-off uh, uh, urban parents who promised this child a better life. Um, in practice, in thousands, in tens of thousands, in hundreds of thousands of cases, these children wind up as, as slaves, as objects. Um, I'm going to tell you a tragic corollary to the story in a second, but um, the, uh, during the negotiation, which I should say, I should give it some flavor here, it was as if we were negotiating for a car stereo. It was that blase. And at a certain point, the trafficker leaned in and he said, this is rather a delicate question, but would you want this child as a partner as well as a domestic slave? And my translator made it perfectly clear what he meant by partner. And for those tens of thousands of children, the majority of whom are girls, sexual abuse is part and parcel of the bondage that they endure. And I said, would it be possible to have this child as a partner as well as a domestic? And he said, we, no problem. The asking price for this child was $100. And the negotiated price, after about two minutes, was 50 US dollars. In 1850, in this country, you could buy a, an adult male in certain parts of the country, in the southern states, for the equivalent in today's money of about $40,000. That is not to say that the dehumanization the degradation, the monstrosity that, that slavery was in, in the mid-19th century was any less. It was absolutely monstrous then, it is absolutely monstrous now, but it is to say that those that bought those individuals would have viewed them as something of an investment. Today, you can go out a few hours from where we are and buy human beings for less than the cost of the cab fare from here to Logan Airport. Uh, that is a <clears throat> radical devaluation of human life and it is a key piece of the puzzle as we begin unraveling just how broad and how deep the problem is and the profit motives that, that lie behind it. Um, since the book came out, as I mentioned, I've, I've continued traveling and writing on, on the subject. And on assignment for Time Magazine in South Africa, prior to the, the last World Cup, I was, uh, I went underground with a, uh, in, uh, I, rather, I went undercover um, to, to infiltrate a Nigerian human trafficking network. This was actually a network that had begun uh, operating in South Africa about 10 years ago, a loose-knit network that had come together and they, their initial uh, investments were primarily in crack. So they were still dealing in crack, but they would cover, they would launder their money um, through uh, the, the flesh trade. Um, they, they would, um, they were much more open about selling human beings, about about um, pimping young girls, beating them up, not, not paying them anything, um, and, uh, and trading the girls back and forth, selling them openly. Um, the reason for that is, at the time, and today, South Africa has no standalone law against human trafficking. And so they were, their, their risk of uh, prosecution was much lower uh, for human trafficking uh, than it was for drug trafficking. So uh, I became very fascinated by this. Uh, on a couple of occasions, I was offered human beings for sale. I should say, as a general statement of principle, um, and this is sort of belied by the, by the title that ABC uh, gave that Nightline special, but I never paid for human life. Uh, 
to me, there was a fundamental issue with, uh, with paying for human life. First of all, um, you either give rise to fraud or you give rise to a trade in human misery. Uh, and second, I just couldn't get over the idea that just buying somebody is not solving the problem. Uh, in fact, it's creating more problems, potentially. Uh, a, a journalist that I've worked with in the past and, uh, and who I have a great deal of respect for, a columnist for the New York Times, uh, for New York Times, uh, Nick Kristof, when he was in Cambodia, bought two girls out of a brothel. He got a receipt for them. And a year back, he went later to find that one of them was right back in the brothel, hooked on crystal meth. Again, we get very quickly to that theme, liberation is not the end of the story. There is a process of emancipation, a process of owning freedom that takes time and it takes partnership. Back to South Africa. Um, after, a couple of days after I was negotiating with, with a trafficker in Port Elizabeth, I, um, I went north to uh, Bloemfontein, and about six blocks from the uh, uh, Free State Stadium, which is, which is one of the World Cup stadiums, which that night was, uh, as it is uh, otherwise, a rugby stadium, and there was a rugby, rugby match going on. A few blocks from that stadium, I was speaking um, to a 15-year-old girl who, to me, put a, an indelible uh, image uh, as to why this is a, a fight that we need to continue, um, and it's a fight that is absolutely urgent. This girl was in a, in a hospice, in a state-run hospice, uh, it was, as I mentioned, Friday night. Uh, it was uh, uh, freezing out. There was no heating in this in this uh, building. Nobody knew where she was. And through halting breaths, she she told me her story. And I had a photographer with me, uh, a photographer named Melanie Hammond, who took magnificent photos. And in addition to changing the names of victims um, and survivors, I. I uh, typically don't show their faces. You can see about, um, about a quarter of Sindiswa's possessions here um, on this table. Sindiswa had been, uh, had been an orphan in the poorest state uh, in East, uh, this is Eastern Cape, poor state uh, and in among the poorest townships of this poor state in South Africa. She'd been offered a job, a restaurant job, by a woman from her town. Uh, the restaurant job was eight hours to the north in Bloemfontein, so she went with her best friend, who I call Elizabeth, um, and when she got to Bloemfontein, she was sold for $35 and a bag of crack. Uh, the bag of crack was given to the recruiter who was an addict. Um, and the person who bought her, his nom de guerre was Jude. Um, and he then forced her and her best friend, uh, Elizabeth, into the sex trade. And uh, they, uh, he forced them to, to work out of a hotel called the, uh, the Maitland Hotel. Uh, on, on the third floor of the Maitland Hotel was where the girls slept, uh, sometimes, um, sometimes three, to a, uh, three or four to a mattress. Um, the, the next floor up, the fourth floor, was an illegal abortion clinic where the, 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 tra the network would force abortions on these girls uh, when they got pregnant. And the fifth floor was what they, they called the, the breaking grounds, where, where members of the network would come in and beat up um, the, the, the new girls, would gang rape them, and if they continued to resist or they were obstinate throughout any time of their bondage, they would defenestrate them, they would throw them out of the windows. Um, and I interviewed one girl who actually survived being thrown out of a window. 
and I, uh, uh, I, I understood from testimony about another one who didn't survive. The end game for a trafficking victim in South Africa, in a place where the HIV infection rate in the general population has hovered between 20 and 25 percent, is pretty certain. After two years, um, Sindiswa was in this condition. She had been kicked out on the street a week earlier because she could no longer stand up. She has full-blown full tuberculosis. Um, she has full-blown AIDS, and she, her, her belly was distended. And the day after this, um, the nurses discovered why. It was because she was three months pregnant. And those three factors had um, combined to cause the rapid metastasis of, of her of the of the of her um, primary disease, and over the through halting breaths uh, over the course of about um, twenty minutes, she told me her her story. And um, as I say, it was freezing, and you can see the beads of sweat here that I would wipe away as soon as as soon as the, uh, I did, they would reappear. And I asked her to turn away so we could take her photograph. As I say, I have the principle of never showing uh, victims' faces. And she insisted that we take her face. She said, I want people to remember me. And at the end of the conversation, after she told me about her, her very brief life, she, um, I said, I asked her a question which in hindsight was kind of silly, but I, I said, um, if there were one thing that you could say to three million readers of Time magazine, what would that be? Uh, and she said, you know, I never learned how to read. I don't really have a context for that. I don't, I don't, know, what, I don't know what I would say, but I, I do want to say something to you, which is thank you for listening to my life, because nobody ever has. And after she said that, uh, a man who joined us at this point, a street pastor by the name of Andre Lombard, uh, asked me a question. He said, where is the trafficker? And the intonation of his question was much more declarative than it was uh, interrogative. A bit of background on, on Lombard. Uh, Lombard had grown up in an abusive household. He'd watched his alcoholic father essentially beat his, his mother to death. At age 17, he left home, joined the South African Special Forces, spent the next 10 years learning how to kill, and after that, decided to be a street pastor, went out on the street, and, um, and essentially uh, worked very hard to, to get girls like Sindiswa off the streets before they wind up in a condition like this. Um, I don't endorse his tactics. Getting, getting, to the, um, getting back to that original idea of emancipation only being the first step, uh, due to limited resources, due to the fact that he was you know, operating largely um, from, uh, out of a sense of passion and in isolation, uh, he did a lot of grabbing the girls off the street and setting them free. Many of them would go back because they had no other way of, of living back in their, in their, um, in their townships. The, um, in, in addition, every night he would go out and he would arm his pastors and he would teach them martial, martial, martial arts and they would get in fights with the traffickers. And these traffickers were, were tough, tough folks. Uh, you can barely see Andre here on the left, and you can even more barely see me, which is a good thing on the right. Um, here we are in front of the Maitland Hotel. My photographer, as I mentioned, was a very courageous South African woman who um, didn't go into the crack house with us that night when we, when we busted in, but um, she did take this shot, which wound up running in Time Magazine along with the story. Um, in Time Magazine, we didn't identify who this was, 
Um, I saw this girl standing in the corner of, of the Maitland. And at this point, we had been driving around the streets. And in certain streets in central Bloemfontein, um, after dark, there will be nobody but women and girls working in prostitution. There will be nobody but women and girls working in prostitution and their johns who are, who are pulling up in cars. And their pimps who are um, farther down the streets. And uh, many of them were clustered together in twos and threes for protection. This girl was standing on her own and she looked very cold and she looked very scared. And she didn't speak much English, but I went up to her and asked her three questions. First question was, how old are you? And she said, 15. Second question, where are you from? Eastern Cape. Third question, do you need help? And she said, yes, very much. I've tried to run away three times, and each time I get caught. And I called over the, um, one of Andre Lombard's other, um, uh, other street pastors who spoke Tosa, who spoke her, her native tongue. And we determined within two minutes that this girl was the first one that we'd spoken to out of dozens that we'd seen that night, happened to be the best friend of Sindiswa, who we'd seen dying earlier that evening. And as I mentioned to you, I, I never paid for human life, but as a journalist writing on issues that are, uh, that are living issues, um, that are, where you're dealing with crimes against humanity that aren't dead yet, that are still, uh, the, their victimhood is ongoing. You can't get in the middle of that and not get involved with the human beings and the human lives that you're touching. And so, uh, in, a, in a very brief conversation with Andre, um, in which he basically gave me the rundown of, of how we were supposed to get through a fight, which is great for me as a Quaker. Uh, cutting to the chase, we managed to get Elizabeth out. Um, and the next day, we drove Elizabeth eight hours to the south. We put her in a shelter um, uh, where, she was, where she could recuperate anonymously. Um, this was not the shelter. Um, this is where she grew up. This is what she was coming from. We went, we talked to her, uh, to her mother who was disabled. This is going into her mother's house. That's how her mother cooked. And that's her mother. And uh, I found a, a donor in Chicago who would pay for school for, for Elizabeth. And uh, I, I keep regular tabs on her and uh, she's, she's uh, alive, she's doing well, she's learned how to read, and she's HIV negative. Uh, it's a stretch to call her lucky, uh, but she has another chance at life. Uh, about a week after this operation, I was flying out through uh, Heathrow in London, and I got an email from my photographer that Sindisua had died. Again, the, the difference between this crime and genocide, uh, and I modeled my book on Samantha Power's terrific book, A Problem from Hell, and, uh, uh, and also Philip Borovich's We Wish to Inform You That Tomorrow We Will Be Killed Along With Our Families. Brilliant books that dealt with a terrible human problem um, the difference between the victims that they were writing about and the victims that I'm writing about and the victims that I'm talking to all of you about right now is that without action, slaves will die in bondage. This is very much a living crime. It's all around us and it's something that we can make a big difference on. Uh, very briefly, I want to talk about some of those 
some of those ways to make a difference, and then we can flesh it out more in, a, in, in Q and A. But um, uh, critically, get involved. Um, you can do much more than you think you uh, you can sitting here. Um, one thing that I that I talked to the students at dinner about, but but um, haven't talked at all about here, is the issue of supply chain slavery, and the issue of slavery and the products that we buy, that that may be in our homes, that we may be wearing right now. Last summer, I, I uh, did an investigation in Sao Paulo, and talked to uh, survivors of. Uh, and actual victims at the time, Bolivian uh, survivors and Bolivian victims of human trafficking that were making uh, garments, that were, that were manufacturing clothes in sweatshops that they were locked in, uh, that they couldn't leave seven days a week. They had to work from uh, 6 a.m. until 2 a.m. some days. Uh, they were beaten up. There was, there was uh, uh, such coercive methods as... as uh, as in addition to the violence as rape and as gang rape. Um, and what got me most was they were sewing labels on clothes that I saw uh, two months later in a, in a store in Switzerland, in Davos. They were selling clothes, they were manufacturing clothes for European markets. Um, the investigator that I went in with from the Ministry of Labor a few months after that, <coughs> uncovered other slaves uh, in the same favela that were manufacturing clothes for Zara, which is a label that, that, that you can buy here in the United States, that you can buy in Boston. Uh, so this is not far from where we live. Fundamentally, policymakers and particularly corporations will not do the hard work of, of revealing what is in our clothes, what is in the products that we buy, what is in our food, in terms of the labor inputs, unless we ask them about it. Uh, there's a very good bill that was passed last fall and is coming online in California called the California Transparency and Supply Chains Act. Um, in, in January, it goes into effect. It requires every corporation that makes over $100 million and files tax receipts in the state of California to publicly declare what they're doing to evaluate their supply chains um, on the issue of forced labor. This is a good bill. Um, it's, it's pushing things in the right direction. There's an out. Corporations can say, hey, we don't know what's in our supply chains. And they will still be in compliance with the law. Fundamentally, that law and any other bill or law that, that we could push for is only as effective as, as we are in terms of asking for it to be enforced and rigorously checking that it's doing the right thing. And that, and, and that law enforcement and that the regulators that are responsible for assessing compliance uh, are, are doing their jobs. Um, beyond that, uh, there are excellent uh, non-governmental organizations that work on this, and we have a couple of uh, folks here who've worked with such groups as Not For Sale and Invisible Children. Um, I'd, I'd add to the list Free the Slaves, which is the American wing of the oldest human rights organization. Again, a quarter of the proceeds of my book go there. Um, uh, Free the Slaves fundamentally has figured out how to do that work that I talked about very well. Not only do they get slaves out? First of all, they never pay for human life. They get slaves free by any means necessary, short of paying uh, for, for, their, for their lives and short of breaking the law. And then fundamentally, they work with those slaves and their communities to make sure that they can start a tea shop, to make sure that they can get educated, to make sure that they can spread messages of freedom and messages of awareness about traffickers. And they have a remarkably good track record. Um, they, uh, they are now working in India, for example, and going village by village to free thousands of people. So um, there, are, there are many ways to get involved, and we'll talk more.
about other ways. But fundamentally, I want to leave you with uh, a thought that was first expressed by Henry David Thoreau, who was writing to a friend of his uh, two days before the first shots were fired of the American Civil War. And Thoreau, like me, was, was torn between uh, his rage against slavery um, and his strong feelings of abolitionism with his, with his strong belief in pacifism. And he could see that these two ideals were not going to be compatible in the very short-term future. And he wrote to this friend of his, Parker Pillsbury, he wrote to him and he said, be careful reading the newspapers. This was, um, this was his friend who had been reading reports of slavery and the rumbling disunion in the New York Herald. Be careful reading newspapers. If you know of it, you're particeps criminis. You're a partner in the crime. What business have you, if you are an angel of light, to be pondering over the deeds of darkness? And he meant that as an admonition, as a warning. I take that, and I hope all of you take it, as an exhortation, as a, as a call to arms, as a call to get involved. And with that, we've got a bit of time for questions, and let's talk about ways to do it. Thank you very much. Please. Uh, thank you, first, for the wonderful presentation. I wanted to ask you, uh, it, it's, it's clear in many countries, uh, the police force, the government, they just uh, turn their eyes away from slavery and do nothing about it. Uh, are there some governments in the world or some parts of the world that the governments are more involved and, and it's part almost of, of what they do and how they get funding? And, uh, mm -hmm. Can you say a few words about that? It's, it, it's, a, it's a very good question. Um, uh, uh, in your part of the world, historically, uh, in the Balkans, there has been a lot of complicity between, um, for example, the police forces, uh, and um, and in the case of um, in the case of Kosovo, the the, the, the rebel groups, um, uh, the local authorities with traffickers, because traffickers are extraordinarily powerful, uh, they're extraordinarily rich. Um, there's a lot of money to be made, and this has only really been recognized as the crime against humanity that it is um, in earnest for the last 12 years. Um, it's only really come on the international radar screen. And, and in the last uh, 12 years, and this is one of the legacies of the Bush administration, um, there have been over 100 laws passed, 100 national laws passed on human trafficking. And I will give credit to one small office, one small underfunded office, the, the, depart, um, the Office to Monitor and Combat Trafficking in Persons in the U.S. State Department. Um, uh, they get a lot of the credit for pushing those laws forward. Um, in, uh, in direct answer to your question, the government with the most robust response to this has been the U.S. government. Um, the, uh, after the Trafficking Victims Protection Act was passed in 2000, there was, a, there was an infrastructure, a um, small infrastructure built out um, that, that sought to not only combat it at home, combat slavery at home, but also uh, an ambassador whose job it was to go out and push for these laws to be passed and also um, to oversee a report, an annual report that's still published uh, on how every country on earth was doing. So. Um, the best, um, uh, the, the more comprehensive answer is to go and look at that report because um, countries are ranked in, in different tiers as to how they're doing. Now, there's a critical point about this. Um, it, was a, it was a big issue in the Bush administration largely because it was um, pushed on, on the right by an evangelical crowd that cared very deeply about it, and on the left, by a, 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 f a feminist lobby that cared very deeply about um, eradicating prostitution. Um, uh, but getting up high up in the inbox um, uh, of policymakers doesn't necessarily mean retaining funding. Um, and thanks to Congress's uh, budget cuts, 
the already infinitesimal budget of the, uh, of the office was cut by 25% this year. Um, and that means they're spending about $20 million um, to fund programs overseas that, that uh, free human beings. Um, to me, we should be spending more on, uh, on freeing human beings than we spend on the Army Band, um, which currently we spend more money on the Army Band than we spend on freeing human beings. Um, uh, another shocking, <coughs> glaring statistic for me is that um, in this country, we spend um, as much on an annual basis to fight the traffic in human beings as we do, in fact, we spend less on an annual basis to fight the traffic in human beings than we do on a daily basis to fight the traffic in illegal drugs, in illegal narcotics. And that is not to diminish the relative horrors of smoking pot, or it is not to diminish the, 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 the real terrors that the drug trade brings, but it is to say which is the more monstrous crime. Is it a 15-year-old like Sindiswa being sold for rape and ultimate destruction on the street corner, or is it a 15-year-old selling pot on the street corner? And I think unless we ask hard questions about priorities, about funding priorities, we won't get answers and we won't have change. More questions? In the back. Yeah, you said uh, once slaves were liberated, it was time for them to fall back into slavery. Uh, just through your experience, what do you think the solution is to the permanent liberation instead of temporary? Um, so, is, the question was about uh, uh, that li liberation is only the first step in the process. Sorry, I, I, I'm... Yeah, you just said a lot of slaves fell back into slavery once they are liberated. Yeah. Through your experience, what do you think the solution is to permanent liberation instead of just that temporary? Um, it's, it, there's no one cookie cutter approach to it. Um, and groups that have come in in the early stage of the in the early years of the new abolitionist movement, I think we can, we can look back at history and say that we're now in the fourth and I hope the final abolitionist movement. Um, the, the groups that came in with the idea what, what works in Moldova will also work in um, Cambodia came to a hard realization that it just doesn't, doesn't work that way. There's a lot that is culturally specific. Um, the reason I like free the slaves models is they don't do that. They actually go out and find groups and individuals that are working on the ground already without funding and are, and are being effective at getting slaves out and keeping them free. Um, the, the, the broad answer to your question is um, there are well over, there are about 1.7 billion people living in absolute poverty, at least 1.1 billion people living on less than a dollar a day. Not all of them are slaves. Um, but that creates the single largest pool of potentially enslavable people on Earth. And there are a lot of people who, when it comes down to watching their child, a choice between um, watching their child slowly uh, starve or die of dehydration because they have uncontrollable diarrhea or, or whatever it is that would be easy, easily solvable in this country um, or giving their child away to a trafficker and an uncertain fate, that's, that's really no choice at all. It's a devil's choice. And unless we target programs for those communities um, with development assistance, um, with, with the kind of targeted partnering um, uh, programs that, that leverage skills and, most importantly, desires and knowledge um, on the part of the, the local uh, communities that are already being targeted by traffickers, we won't solve this fight anytime soon. Um, the end of poverty, uh, sorry, the end of slavery cannot wait for the end of poverty. But, again, without those targeted assistance programs, we won't be able to solve this in a generation. And I, I, I fundamentally believe that we can. Put in more concrete terms, um, the amount of money that free the slaves programs, for example, um, uh, the, the amount of money that those programs spend, and this includes 
uh, everything from staffing, uh, which is, you know, the, the, they basically have no foreign staff, um, but they have, um, uh, or they have American staff that go out and evaluate and make sure the programs are doing well and, and, um, and take the metrics. Um, but uh, most of the money goes to uh, rehabilitation packages to, um, uh, to start up microcredit um, uh, organizations or um, credit unions or whatever it is that the local communities need, legal representation to get, to get land rights, et cetera. Um, the, the amount of money on average that those programs cost per slave to free one slave and keep them free for the, for, over the course of five to six years is about $400. You multiply that out by the high end estimate, 27 million slaves in the world today. Um, and we're talking about uh, roughly 10 to $11 billion, which sounds like a lot of money until, again, you compare what we as Americans spent that much money on. I mean, that was, we spent more than that on the big dig, which leaks. Um, we, we spend more than that money uh, uh, every, every year on Valentine's Day. Um, again, it's a question of, of priorities. And to me, uh, the possibility of ending slavery you know, in, a, in, our, in our lifetime is, uh, should be very high up that list of, uh, high up that list of priorities. Please. Sorry, speak up. Um, I feel like you focus a lot about going into the communities where slavery is occurring and trying to change the day. But um, what do you think about like the industries that depend on those communities? Do you think they'll just keep finding more slaves after? And should like we change our lifestyles so that we're not dependent on those industries anymore? That's true. It's it's an excellent question, and you know, in the book, I didn't go into. Um, so-called supply chain slavery to the extent that I am now about to um, embark on a research project to, to, to analyze. It's, it's very difficult um, to trace as, a, as an outsider, as a journalist, as an investigator, um, exactly which products um, and which brands are infected with slave labor. Um, and Kevin Bale's estimate is that the worst um, product, say um, gold from Ghana, um, will be about 10% uh, produced by slave labor. Um, the challenge is if you then um, summarily boycott gold from Ghana, you are disproportionately uh, hurting those producers, many of them will be artisanal miners who are poor, who are struggling, but are free. Um, and, uh, it, it, and potentially, uh, as was the case in, in the Congo, uh, when, a, when a recent conflict minerals uh, law was passed, the, those that aren't doing the right thing will just continue to smuggle the, the, the metals out into another country, um, brand them as, as from that other country, and um, and and then there, thereby wash them, and so it's very difficult for you as the American consumer to tell. Um, I think the key thing is that executives need to be asked, and they need not just to be asked by consumers, um, but by investors and by shareholders, um, and it needs to be made clear that this matters. In the same way that the environmental movement, I think, has had a, a, a decent amount of success um, in terms of bringing sustainability issues uh, up the agenda of corporate boardrooms, this needs to at least be in the conversation. Start there. Um, and then, very quickly, we need to get to a point where uh, companies understand that consumers will make certain buying decisions uh, on the basis of of uh, whether there's, uh, how, how effectively they disclose what they've done to, to monitor and combat slavery uh, in their supply chains, and, um, and really how clean their products are in the end. Uh, but it won't begin unless, unless we ask those questions. And you know, pushing for a Massachusetts law along the, um, uh, 
along the, the model of the California SB 657 isn't a bad way to start. In the back. Good evening, everyone. Hi. Uh, so before I, I comment or ask any questions, uh, allow me as a Sarakian citizen to say thank you. The work you're doing here is truly, really, I think, all the South African citizens who are present in the community here. It is very important and truly it is sad because I just found out myself that you went out in the room that I was only 15 minutes away from moving. Hmm. I'm a student at the University of the Free State, which is the biggest university wow. in the Free State and is located in movement. Uh, so with that being said, I thank you very much, sir. And I would like to ask, you mentioned that South Africa has no laws against uh, human trafficking. I'll flush that out. <laughs> okay. okay. I, I would also like to understand uh, that, that the victims of slavery, uh, what do they say regarding the, the government, to the police, most particularly the, the South African police services? Because as far as I know, the, 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 policy, the policy is that if you're a young child lost, abused, or anything similar to that, you can stop in police car, which mm -hmm. they are plenty of, and you should be taking back to your life from home. Firstly, how, how do they say it, that situation might sound? And uh, secondly, what does the world say? Mm -hmm. I and mean, if South Africa is letting such a thing, which is a global problem taking place, what does the UN and the rest of the world say about it? Ex excellent questions. And what a coincidence. <laughs> um, the, uh, the sad fact is, well, first of all, on the issue of laws, um, there, is, there is a way to prosecute individuals like Jude, um, the trafficker that we wound up finding, but it's under a lot of other bills, the Child, Child Protection Acts, those, those, um, uh, those bills that deal with sexual abuse. Um, those deal, those bills that, that deal with um, uh, with kidnapping. Um, uh, there is no when I say there's no standalone law against human trafficking. There is no law uh, equivalent to what is in the uh, United States on this. And the South African government um, has agreed under the the international um, framework, which you asked about, the the UN framework. It's uh, known as the Palermo Protocol. Um, to adopt a, a law in keeping with their, their model law on human trafficking. An essential element of that law, which is now missing from the South African legal system, is, is the idea that a, if a victim goes willingly in the first case, for example, Sandiswa and Elizabeth both went willingly from, from their uh, township in, in Eastern Cape to Bloemfontein, but, um, but when they got there, the situation changed radically, and they were, they were beaten up. Um, Elizabeth tried to escape three times. One of the times, she actually went to the police. She went, to, she went with a policeman who was one of her clients, who had been paying for sex from her in Bloemfontein since she was 13 years old. Uh, he took her right back to the trafficker. So, um, and... I was working actually with, a, with one of the few members of the South African Police Services who um, took it on himself to, to go out and build investigations and initially had a lot of resistance from other members of the South African Police Service. And, and at one point, he was staking out the Bloemfont, uh, the, the, uh, the Maitland Hotel, and in the middle of the night, he saw uh, 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 a... Um, an unmarked police vehicle pull up, um, and none other than the, than the Bloemfontein chief uh, p police commissioner got out with a 13-year-old girl, went into the Maitland, and came out a half hour later on his own. Um, now, I had that verified by three, uh, three others who were in, the, uh, in that sting operation. And so the problem is is very, very difficult to, to wrestle with. In, um, in KZN, in, in KwaZulu-Natal, there was a, uh, a survey done uh, of, of 
uh, men of male residents of KwaZulu-Natal. And the question was asked, um, have you ever raped somebody? And 25% said openly in a survey that they had. If you're acknowledging something like that in a survey, there's probably not enough societal pressure to contain that kind of abuse against women. So that's part of the problem. Second part of the problem, as I, as I mentioned, as you, as you were asking about, are the laws. Um, and the, um, the fact that there is no standalone law against human trafficking means that when, when I initially, uh, when we brought Elizabeth out and, and we brought her to the shelter and we, we called a uh, social worker from the social ministry um, to come out and see her and, um, and uh, assess what would be the best course of rehabilitation for her. I got a call from that um, social worker a day later saying, I have great news. She's not a victim of human trafficking because she went willingly. So there is this fundamental misunderstanding that if somebody goes from point A to point B um, uh, willingly, that they are somehow not a victim. Um, now, the Palermo Protocol clearly describes that um, as being irrelevant. The, the initial willingness to go from point A to point B is being irrelevant to the, to the ultimate assessment of the crime. But unfortunately, in, in South Africa, that, that hasn't taken hold. And this, by the way, this was a perfectly um, good person, as far as I could tell, the social worker. And I just went in with a lot of literature after blowing my stack at her. <laughs> I went in with a lot of literature about what human trafficking was and said, listen, you have to protect this girl. And um, to date, she's done the right thing. But obviously in South Africa, um, and South Africa, by the way, which, as you well know, is the, is the crown jewel in sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, it's the, it, it is outpacing the rest of the continent in terms of growth, in terms of, uh, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of development. Um, and this is just, this is one of those issues that um, if South Africa doesn't take the lead, who will? Please. Um, so I'm also from South Africa, and I just have to add my voice to what Paul said. Um, I'm really totally shocked. I was born in Bloemfontein. Mm -hmm. And what shocked me the most is the fact that I can come all the way to the UK to find out about something that happens in my own city. I never knew anything about this. I was born and raised in that same city. Mm -hmm. I live maybe in a richer neighborhood, other parts of the city. But what I would like to ask is, um, there are lots of people in South Africa that can do something about this. But I don't know if they all know about it. You know, I'm, I'm trembling, I'm angry. If I was in South Africa now, I would have done something. I wish I knew about this earlier. So, um, please, uh, if we can get this kind of information to the people that live in these cities. I never knew about this. I don't, I don't think one of you can imagine it. That I live in this city, but I don't know about this. I went to school, I'm in the university in this city. I don't know about this. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. So, um, I really want to thank you for the work you do. And I'm so shocked, I just think that makes sense. <laughs> well, thank you. Th thank you for speaking up. And there is a distinct need for organization, and it's got to come from our generation on this. It really has to come from our generation. And, and, it's, and it's got to be, um, I, I think in South Africa in particular, um, it's got to be a coalition from the cities, from the townships, um, white, black, um, everybody coming together on this issue. Because fundamentally it's not, um, it's not an issue uh, that doesn't affect all South Africans. Um, there, there are a couple of organizations. There's an organization in Cape Town called Mola Sangalolo. Um, there is another organization, uh, well, the International Organization of Migration. They deal a little bit with this issue, but the big flaw is they only deal with foreign-born victims. And getting to the theme of the, the series, um, the, the vast majority of victims in South Africa don't cross a border. Um, they're, they're, they're moved within South Africa. Um, so there is a real space here for, for activism, and I encourage you to reach out. Also, there's a group called Media Monitoring Africa, which has begun, begun to do a bit of work on this. My colleague, Melanie Hammond, um, who's, a, who's the terrific photographer on this, um, I'm sure would love to hear from you. And,
and uh, and Andre Lombard also. Um, you know, I again, I, I'm not endorsing all of his tactics, I think, but in a space where you're dealing with such violence um, and you're dealing with such lawlessness and where you're dealing with police that are complicit with the violent lawbreakers gives rise to vigilantism and, and what Andre does borders on that. But, uh, you know, I think, I think definitely he walks on the side of the angels. Ma'am. Uh, thank you very much. And you can point South Africa also, but I'm from not to me, campus, in Kota campus. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh, it was the first time I heard about it. We had a case in our university where one student from KZ organization, because we were working with a support service, a social worker just had kind of explained that that particular person was kidnapped mm-hmm. and he was folded in, a, in a her eyes and he was put at some way. Then even when he arrived there, no, he couldn't actually identify the place. And he was raped and sexual abuse by attack. And in the moment, some, somehow he managed to escape. And when he escaped, he didn't even know the place, he didn't even know where. He looked for the lift and until he just said, I, I'm actually studying at the university of the campus. He came here. He went to the social work. The social worker see the need for students to go trafficking, human trafficking. And she made some efforts to just actually educate students about human trafficking. I think in local, in that case, as not happen. But uh, most of the time, when we talk to between um, Kwakwa and Kwakwa, they we found small children in the street corners. And police just leave them. They don't even stop the cars. That means it's a matter. Those ones are we they just attract the hospitals and they are small kids. So we saw them even in, in Blanco again and last time we went to the meeting in Blanco Day. At night we wanted to go and buy food. We found streamline of gas, yeah, girls mm-hmm. in the store. I had a testimony for this, so thank you very much. Oh, well, thank, th- th- thank you for sharing that. I, I think it, again, it underscores particularly the two states where most of the victims come from, certainly are KZN and Eastern Cape. Um, and then you also have a lot of victims um, uh, coming from Lesotho, coming, coming from Swaziland. Um, and uh, those are, those are uh, a few that the International Organization of Migration Will, will, will care for. But for the most part, it sounds like what's happening in South Africa in terms of, res- of a response is like that social worker who just decides to sort of do it on her own. Um, and um, there's nothing wrong with deciding to do it on your own. It just helps when you have other people working with you. So um, I'm glad the three of you are, are <coughs> active on this. Any, uh, please. Hi, good evening. Um, I wanted to thank you for your work. And um, so I, I can say that I live in Worcester and I work in Worcester. And I'm a human rights attorney and I represent victims of human trafficking. So if you think you have to go very far, you don't. Um, I just wanted to let people know there's plenty of, of work right here if you wanted to get involved. So. Can you name a couple of good uh, local organizations? So, Lutheran Social Services is an agency in Worcester. We do statewide work. We have a human um, trafficking project that provides case management and legal services. So, um, that's the best source in Worcester. Lutheran Social Services. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you for your work. And and I'm I'm glad you brought that up. Um, Massachusetts, correct me if I'm wrong. And it may have changed in this, this latest legislative cycle, but I think Massachusetts is one of four states now that doesn't have a, a law against human trafficking. That's right. I testified last January, and we have right now we have pending one bill in the, in the, in the House and one bill in the Senate, and they have to be reconciled. So potentially we could have a bill, but it's, it's been years. Good, good point for activism there, certainly. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you all very much.